Hello everybody, welcome to the Wonky Angle, where I talk about electronic music, both new and old. And today, as a Patreon request from Waffles, I'm talking about the 2007 album from Stars of the Lid and their refinement of the decline. Alright, boy, was this one of the biggest requests on my schedule, but one I was especially intrigued to get into when it was sent in to me. Stars of the Lid was the legendary ambient duo of Adam Wiltsey and Brian McBride. They were mostly active from the mid-90s through the early 2000s, putting out ambient drone records inspired by classical minimalism, I guess. The while both members have been keeping mildly busy periodically putting out various solo records and side projects in more recent years, and Stars of the Lid never officially broke up, this as of now, is their final album, and they haven't put out anything else under the Stars of the Lid name since it came out in 2007. And this album itself was technically a comeback following a six-year hiatus after their previous album in 2001, The Tired Sounds of Stars of the Lid. Minor side note, I also listened to that album in full once while preparing for this video since it gets recommended to me a lot, if not even more than this one. If you're curious about my thoughts on that one, they're very, very similar to my thoughts on the album I'm about to review. I think I like Refinement more, but there may be some bias there since I only listened to Tired Sounds once and I listened to Refinement like eight times. Their first five albums in the 90s are also all generally well-liked as far as I can tell, and from what I've previewed of them, they seem to be uh, kind of in the same general ballpark as their 2000s work without giving me that much specific to say about them. I did quite like what I heard of Gravitational Pull vs. The Desire of an Aquatic Life and Avic Laudanum. Uh, the former sounded like it had some slightly more experimental touches, the latter sounded, I, I, I guess, had a more subtle approach that I could be cool. But this album and Tired Sounds are the two that get by far the most attention and are most frequently highlighted as among the greatest ambient albums of all time. The album I'm about to review currently has a Metacritic score of 87 out of 100. That much consensus was built on it. And there's tons of 10 out of 10 retrospective reviews from both fans and professional critics. But as much praise as And Their Refinement of the Decline has amassed over the years, it's seemingly amassed almost just as many detractors who think it's massively overrated and one of the most tedious things they've ever sat through. It's both one of the most well-loved, well-acclaimed, and also one of the most divisive records in ambient music history. The guy who sent this in to me obviously falls more within the former category. He told me he considers it one of his all-time favorite ambient albums, right up there with the likes of Aphex Twin Selected Ambient Works Volume 2 and Biosphere Substrata going as far as to say it's probably his second favorite ambient album of all time behind the latter of those. I personally was really excited to hear this project on the promise that fans had set for it, and had uh, just slightly taken its detractors with a grain of salt. A few I saw seemed to talk about it as if they just weren't fans of ambient music on a general level. And now I've been sitting with this album for several weeks now. I've made the trek through it at least, like, as mentioned before, like seven, eight times at this point, trying to fully pin down my feelings. Am I on the side of it uh, being an all-time transcendental experience, or am I on the side of it being an overpraised slug? Uh, I'm gonna have to say neither. After all the time I've spent with this project, I completely understand both sides of the divide on this album. I both totally get all the 10 out of 10 reviews and all the 5 out of 10 reviews I've seen. Between the two, I think I lean a bit more towards the people who love it. For me, it's like, right on the border of greatness. Though I was consistently going back and forth between whether I loved it or merely really liked it. I see exactly what its fans see to be so life-changing in it, but at the same time I also cannot blame anyone who had such a hard time with it in the slightest. It... it ain't gonna be for everyone. And the biggest drawbacks to this album are extremely easy to explain. First of all, this album isn't just any old ambient drone album, it's a two hour long ambient drone album. 18 tracks over two CDs, almost exactly 120 minutes of music. And albums of that length are obviously always going to be a big commitment, especially when it comes to this specific genre, which is not exactly designed to stimulate the listener or grab their attention in the traditional way. But it's not just the length of the album and the extremely minimalistic and slow-paced style that places its barrier to entry so high. 
it's the sameness as well. It's two hours of very similar ideas over and over, and it has a strong tendency to run together. Especially in the first disc. This ain't your easy FSOL's Life Forms or The Orb's Adventures Beyond the Ultra World. It's an extremely patience-testing listen with so little seemingly going on in the way of instrumental texture that it can become quite difficult to give your full attention to at all. Some of the listens I gave it almost entirely blended into the background for me, and what's worse is that it kind of needed my fuller attention and more repeat listens to really start clicking with me. It requires so much out of the listener, with seemingly so little reward on the surface, that I can't fault anyone for feeling it wasn't worth all the effort. But at the same time, as simple and stripped back as all of it is, and how similar all the ideas are, they do all carry a boatload of deep and earnest emotion behind them. And it's also not like they're completely lacking in texture either. These mixes of melted down guitars, pianos, and orchestral string arrangements always feel very vast and profound and are very easy to emotionally connect with. Even with as many cuts that are, like, in a simple major key, none of them ever felt cheesy. Uh, while they were all extremely sentimental, it was never the point of sappiness. It's never a brooding dirge, and it's never an unrealistically peaceful utopia. It's always right in that perfect gray area of acknowledging the darkness of the world, but trying to find hope within it. It always feels very empathetic and comforting in an entirely genuine way. And what it might lack in more distinct textures, it always tries to make up for in terms of its melodic construction. You will probably be able to tell whether or not this album will be for you by the first track, Dung Titled in A Major, which starts out with funereal trumpets and grows into some very warm and emotional pads and str of strings and synths, which both feel very thin, but also very wide open, as if exploring the vacuum of space. I've seen it described as a more subtle take on the opening title theme of 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is pretty accurate. This album is... there's a lot of parallels between this album and 2001 A Space Odyssey you can make. If you hear this track and think you'd like to experience two hours of that kind of stuff, this album will probably be worth hearing. Granted, I do also feel like that opener is one of the absolute best and most resonant moments here. I wouldn't say every track here is able to fully measure up to what that one does. Articulate Silences Part 1 isn't quite as much of an emotional heavy hitter as the opener was. It tends to be very spacey and more musically ambiguous. Although in the last minute or so, there are these really delicate and sentimental string passages which do hit it on a deeper note. And I do feel like part two gets a fair bit more satisfying with a much fuller sounding mix that has a bit more bass presence, especially as all these cellos come in later on. This pair of tracks actually kind of reminds me of a very specific part of the soundtrack to the game uh, Submachine 7, the core. Uh, there's a track on that soundtrack that sounds kind of like those delivered through some minimal choir pads. I suspect it may have been directly inspired by this album or just Stars of the Lid in general. Though a lot of the first half of this album switches off like this between tracks that really do it for me and tracks that eh, kind of just seem to blend in the background more. Uh, following track The Evil That Never Arrived mostly seems to focus on a progression of two very slowly repeating synth chords and that's pretty much it. I do always notice when it happens and can have an image in my head of what it sounds like, and some of the occasional bass washes are nice, though it was never one of the more engaging moments for me and the idea never really seemed to go anywhere that much. And the even more minimal and funereal trumpet drones on a preludes in C-sharp major also never really stuck out to me, even if there is a nice slow build-up through that one. And both of these tracks pale in comparison to the 10-minute Don't Bother They're Here. Uh, even if this track initially mostly picks up from the same ideas that the last two tracks left off with in its mix of minimal pads, that typically take me like at least a full minute for me to even notice a hard part of a new track. I do feel like this track does have a bit more evolution than most tracks uh, here do, the way its pads slowly shift into different places and into slightly different shapes until eventually settling on a looping progression of tender broken piano chords about three minutes in. That, 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 uh, loop of pianos does keep me pretty invested throughout that whole running time, pretty much. And eventually, the idea behind this track is built on in a more lighthearted way, on, uh, Dopamine Clouds Over Craven Cottage. So named because Craven Cottage is a, uh, soccer stadium in London. Uh, the team that played there, Fulham FC, had a player called, uh, Brian McBride, same name as one of the guys in Stars of the Lid. 
and uh, they start the track with like a low mix commentary from a sports announcer talking about that player's performance in a game. The actual track is a fair bit more meandering than the track it immediately followed in its mixes of higher pitched pianos and shifting pads that very slowly and almost completely fade out by the end. Another one that it kind of tended to fall into the background more for me, maybe the association with soccer-related imagery made it less likely to emotionally connect with me since I'm not a sports person in general. And that's followed by another big nine-minute track in Even If You're Never Awake. At first, this track doesn't really grab me in its loops of pad progressions that float back and forth between three chords that run through the first two minutes or so, but eventually the track takes on a much more wintry texture that pulls me in much more effectively. There are some more chilling sets of chords that always feel like they're about to resolve but never quite do. They start to fill a lot more of the mix next to uh, these lower key oboe-ish melodies in the background and eventually some light pianos that join in uh, that feel like falling snowflakes. This track nearly fades out at the end, but instead has its ideas directly continued in the comparatively more monolithic tones of Even Out Plus, uh, which has a lot of the same pads from the previous track, blurring together a lot more and becoming much more formless while going up next to some maybe field recordings of rain or something. I, I didn't even notice those until my most recent listen, honestly. <laughs> I'll admit this is another track that I would pretty consistently not even notice while it was playing since it blends in a bit too well with the previous cut, but uh, thankfully the disc does have a particularly strong ending in a meaningful moment through a meaningless process, which has all these windy piano chords echoing over all these pads in a much lighter and more striking way. Eventually, the pads and pianos trade what purpose they serve, with the pianos forming more of a bassy foundation and the pads forming more of like a windy whistling on top, which that was, that was really cool. That one always stuck out to me any time it came up. So yeah, I, I mean, this, the, this first disc of the album has all been well and good, even if it can often feel like a single, continuous, hour-long track. Uh, but I do feel like the second disc of this album is a fair bit stronger. Uh, one could say it doesn't flow as well, but I'll say instead that it doesn't run together quite as easily and is able to deliver a bit more variety, which can often be a breath of fresh air and allow more tracks to stand out apart from each other. Take the way this disc starts with another ballad for heavy lids. I think this is the first track on the album to be rooted in a minor key, and its washes of string and synth pads do feel a fair bit more dramatic than a lot of other previous tracks on the first disc. Despite being just as sparse as everything else on the album, there is more of an interesting sense of weight and tension behind this one. Though that's contrasted with a 13 minute The Daughters of Quiet Minds, initially reorganizing some of the same chords from the previous track to sound a bit more hopeful and spacey again and eventually building into some warm and evocative loops of string pads that sound like they're begging for, like, Carl Sagan to start narrating over them. And those chords eventually start slowly evolving into a single chord drone that later uh, finally gets some more satisfying bass washes to join in, like nine minutes in, and then the track ends the same way it started, which is cool. It's one of those tracks I may have had my attention trail off a bit, especially in the middle when it's just uh, reduced to, like, one chord. But it, it still has some of the coolest and most resonant ideas contained within. After a quick less than two minute interlude of almost solo cello and hibernare toujours, which uh, that, that does hit quite nicely, I like that one, uh, we hit That Finger on Your Temple is the Barrel of My Ray Gun, which is probably the closest this album has to a dud for me. The looping progressions of synth chord pads on this one going over the water sound effects can feel a little too oddly thin and not as musically satisfying as some of these other tracks. Probably not a track I'd ever seek out on its own, though the particular tone of the synth pads here does at least have a slightly unique sound to it that allows it to add some variety in the greater context of the album. Though I really don't have any complaints for the remaining four tracks, uh, Humectes La Mouture uh, starts with some brooding horns and a random French spoken word snippet before breaking into a slow building minimal piano piece which has a particularly spooky quality to it that made it really stick out as a highlight to me on every listen. And then solo piano is traded for solo strings on Tippy's Demise, lots of brooding funereal pads of violins and cellos on that one that also slowly evolved and build up over time and eventually introduce more present lead violin melodies on top and get marginally brighter as the track rolls along. I do always enjoy me a good orchestral string piece like this, and this one did hit uh, really consistently as well. 
Then, after a three minute track of slow moving bell sounds on the mouth cue that almost functions as an interlude, uh, the album finally culminates in its biggest piece of all, the near 18 minute closer given the classiest title of December Hunting for Vegetarian Fuckface. And uh, I don't know how they managed to make a track that basically just focuses on one single unchanging string pad chord, one of the biggest emotional heights of the whole album, but they did. Well, okay, it's not quite just one unchanging chord. It does sort of ebb and flow like waves for a little while and start to pick more and more of a brighter and triumphant quality as it goes along. There's this awesome quick little moment right around the halfway mark where it sounds like they filtered the sound of like a truck pulling away on the street into this big and thunderous rush of bass, which was really satisfying. And in the last four minutes or so of the track, there's finally some other lead violin and cello melodies that join in that monolithic drone and give it a bit more of a sense of movement before it eventually just peters out and ends on the most warm and final note of finality an, an album like this could end on. And yeah, that's everything on Stars of the Lid and their refinement of the decline. Man, I am so conflicted on this one. <laughs> there are so many great moments all throughout this project. There are so many deep emotional moments, and even the least interesting tracks feel like they serve a purpose and have their place. But it's also so much to sit through and really requires such a specific mood for me to fully get into. I really do feel that length every time, and I don't. I also don't feel like I can just edit it down to just my favorites either, since all these pieces are too closely intertwined with each other. All of that leaves me unsure how often I'm going to come back to this in the future. It's an album I really want to love, and I'm 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 like that close to loving it. I'm I'm just not sure if I'm fully there with it. I'm probably going to keep it on my iPod longer term anyway, just in case that day does come and it does click with me on that deeper level, or in case I just end up really in the mood for certain cuts. In any case, I can't deny that this is an album with uncommon power. It's very difficult to get an album this ridiculously minimalistic, monolithic, and slow-paced to still feel this deep. I feel like everything that's been thrown at this album feels deserved to some degree. The massive praise, the sense of weight and importance that history has somewhat burdened it with, the legions of fans who got a transcendental 10 out of 10 experience, but also the legions of others who just did not get what all the hubbub was about and couldn't vibe with it. I mentioned before that the guy who requested this made the comparison to Selected Ambient Works Volume 2 and Biosphere Substrata to illustrate how deeply this ended up resonating with him. And while I get hell for some like him, this could resonate on that deep a level. And maybe this isn't even a fair comparison for me, since I've only been listening to this album for about a month, compared to those other two which I've been regularly bumping for around a decade each. But my own personal enjoyment of this, it just does not feel comparable to those classics. It could maybe scrape into 8 out of 10 territory if I'm in the right mood for it, but I don't see it landing in the 9 range for me, and that just comes down to the lack of sonic variety. Saw 2 may be even longer and just as minimalistic much of the time, but all 25 tracks on that album feel way more distinct from each other and like they could add something that no other track there could, and I can't really say the same about this album. There's so much greatness in here, but the sameness combined with the length makes it particularly difficult to digest and revisit. Still, I'm certainly not about to disagree with the classic status it's amassed. Even if you end up not enjoying it or finding it to be a tedious chore to get through, if you're an Ambient fan, it will be worth at least one listen, just in case you end up on the side of the coin that ends up finding that transcendental experience that so many have said they did. Whichever side you land on, either positive or negative, I will feel you, and all of that averages out to me feeling the strongest possible 7.7 .7 out of 10 on it. But of course, this is just my opinion. You can feel free to disagree with it, but I'd like to hear your thoughts, so leave the comments in the comment thing down there. Shout out to my Patreon supporters, they're awesome people. You want to add yourself that list, link to my Patreon is in the description. But yeah, that's pretty much it. That's all for today. See you next time.